I've entitled today's message, Rising Above the Sorrow. To rise above the sorrow. There are many times in our lives, there's many circumstances, there's moments in your week where you will experience sadness. Sometimes the sadness will be momentary. Sometimes you're really dealing with loss. Sometimes you're just in a state of sorrow. And as Christians, we know, in our minds we know, that the hope is in Christ. Of all the people in the world, Christians should have reason to rejoice because of our salvation and because of the promise of our future resurrection. But we know that it's difficult. Now, if you're sitting in here this morning, and if you're not yet a believer, meaning you're here because you're seeking Christ, that is one key component of the salvation message. That is, in Christ, you can have joy. A joy that resides from within. A joy that will find its final manifestation when you receive your resurrected body. It is a joy that is eternal. Now, that joy is not a fleeting, emotional feeling of temporary happiness. It is an everlasting joy that flows out of the internal fountain that comes through the Holy Spirit. Now, we've been in the Gospel of John. We've been looking through chapter 14 to 16. And if you've been following us, what's one of the main themes of John chapter 14 and 16, beloved? Can you tell me? What's one of the main themes? The main themes, it's the introduction and the teaching of Satan. You can say Jesus. That's always the right answer. We are in the Gospels. But what did Pastor Terrence talk about last week? The Holy Spirit. I knew it, that even in the Baptist church, I could have you guys say the Holy Spirit. Yeah, the Holy Spirit. And so today's passage is an in-between passage. Jesus has been talking about leaving. He's telling his disciples, I'm going to leave. I need to go, but I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm sending an advocate. I'm sending a helper. I'm sending the Holy Spirit. I'm sending the Holy Spirit. And in next week's passage, there's allusion once again to the peace that overcomes the world. And so, so we're wrapped around this teaching in this entire section about the coming of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is leaving. The Holy Spirit's coming. Jesus is leaving. The Holy Spirit's coming. But today, he's talking about his resurrection. So in between, so we're, we got to talk about the Spirit, but there's also the resurrection. And today, my aim is to connect the two. So title is Rising Above the Sorrow. If you have God's Word, meet me once again in John chapter 16. John chapter 16. John chapter 16, we're going to start with the first two verses, verses 16 and 17. And for this first part of the sermon, we're asking the question, what is Jesus talking about? What is Jesus talking about? That's literally the question that arises from the text. What is Jesus talking about? And I'll let the text make the main points today for you. Let's look at verse 16. Jesus, he's talking to his 11 Okay, he's talking to his apostles, and he says, a little while, and you will see me no longer. And again, a little while, and you will see me. Now you see me, soon you won't, and you'll see me again. Now you see me, soon you won't, and you'll see me again. That's a nice way to summarize what Jesus is saying. Now, verse 17, so some of his disciples said to one another, what is this? Then he says to us, a little while and you will not see me. And again, a little while and you'll see me because I'm going to the Father. That's the question of the text. So that's the first movement of the text. What is Jesus talking about? Now you look at verse 18 and 19. And it says, so they were saying, what does he mean, right? What is he talking about? What does he mean by a little while? We do not know what he's talking about. What's Jesus talking about? They don't know. Verse 19, Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him. So he said to them, is this what you're asking yourselves? What I meant by saying a little while and you will not see me. And again, a little while and you will see me. So again, we're asking the question, what is Jesus talking about? As I mentioned, he's preparing his disciples for his departure, and it's clear at this point that even though they've been sitting under his teaching for three years, 
that they're about to graduate from Jesus' seminary. Three years is the average time for a master's of divinity degree, at least historically, and they're about, they're, these disciples are about to graduate with their master's of divinity from Jesus' seminary, the master's seminary, the real master, the original master's seminary, and they still don't understand what he's been teaching them. They still don't understand what, what he's teaching them. And they're asking. And so Jesus is saying, let me tell you a little bit. Let me tell you a little bit about what I mean. So we're asking, what did Jesus mean by a little while? Now, the disciples didn't understand it. But even theologians today, did you know, they're still debating what did Jesus mean. And so there's a debate over what Jesus means by a little while and you will see me. Now, the first little while is pretty obvious. Even though there's different views on this, I think that we can conclude that when he says, a little while and you will see me no longer, he's talking about going to the cross. So let's just just bury that and say when Jesus goes to the cross, they're not going to see him anymore. He's going to be arrested, he will be crucified, and his disciples will be scattered, they will be afraid, they will be hiding. And so that's what Jesus is saying. In a little while, you will no longer see me. Why? Because I will be taken to be crucified, and I will die, and I will go into the grave, at least temporarily, and they won't see him. And then the second, again, a little while, you will see me, that's debated. That is debated. Now, some say that that is referring to his second coming. It's, it's, that, it's that he's going to die, then he's going to resurrect, and obviously his disciples will see him again, but that this second little while is cryptic language talking about the eschaton, talking about the end times. And the reason why theologians would say that is because of the illustration used later, which I'll show you, of birth pangs, of the pains of childbirth. And in Matthew, at the end of Matthew, in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus used a similar example of birth pangs to refer to the end times. But that is not the strongest interpretation. So I don't think he's talking about his second coming, and you shouldn't either, okay? Uh, Others argue that Jesus is referring to the descent of his Holy Spirit. This is the view espoused by John MacArthur, that Jesus is, is, when he says, a little while, you will not see me, he's going to go to the cross, and then he says, a little while, you'll see me, that John MacArthur is reading the entire context of John 14 to 16 and saying he's not talking about his post-resurrection appearance. He's talking, about, he's talking about what? He's talking about the coming of the Holy Spirit. That figuratively you will see Jesus in the sense of the Holy Spirit. So that's one interpretation. A third interpretation, and this is espoused by scholars like D.A. Carson, Leon Morris, and others. So I'm giving you good Christian teachers, and you can say how we all agree, but there's some agree to disagree, right? And so D.A. Carson would say this is talking about his post-resurrection appearance. And so D.A. Carson's reading it pretty literally that in a little while, you will not see me because I'm going to the cross, and then in a little while, you will see me again after my resurrection. I think the correct interpretation is a combination of two and three, a combination of two and three. Okay, so my aim this morning is to show you that and to show you applicationally why you need both. To see Christ in his resurrection, and the only way you and I see Jesus is, to MacArthur's point, through the Holy Spirit. All right, so let's, let's, let's go to work this morning. All right, you're going to prepare my sermon with me. We're going to do this together. All right, let's look at verse 20. Verse 20 becomes a hinge. Verse 20 says, truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn to joy. Now, why is this a hinge verse? Why is this important? Because this gives you context. This gives you context to exactly what Jesus is speaking about to his disciples. He's saying, you will not see me, and then you will see me. When you don't see me, you will weep. You will have sorrow, but when you see me again, you will rejoice. Your sorrow will turn into joy. And that gives you a real live context. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament. When? When Jesus is arrested, what's going to happen? His disciples are going to go through a crisis. 
Everything that they have placed their faith in, in this person of Jesus Christ, they don't have the benefit that you and I have post-resurrection. They don't have the gospels completed yet. They don't know the end of the story. They, unlike you, were on the other side of Easter. Sunday morning had not come yet. And so they knew what Jesus taught, but all they saw was that their master, their rabbi, was arrested, beaten, spat on. And can you imagine that? They saw this man turn water into wine. Let the party continue, Jesus said, right? They saw Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead. They saw him generate miracle after miracle. And can you imagine? Now, Peter, he was cowardly, but but you, you know in the Gospels that he was peeking. He was looking. And he saw, and could you imagine what his disciples were thinking? Come on, Jesus, do something. You're gonna really let them spit on you? We know you're stronger than that. Jesus, just when are you going to send your angels? Come on, come on. And even as he's crucified, we know that the disciples are hiding, but John was there. John was there. And I imagine if John for a moment said, not understanding the full gospel, looking at Jesus, said, okay, you're going to come down now. You know, you're, you're not going to breathe your last. You're not going to breathe your last. An angel's going to come and get you. And we're going to establish the kingdom. Could you imagine the crisis that you would go through if you gave your life to this man who said he's the Messiah and he's proven that he can fulfill every prophecy through his miracles and his works and his teaching. And yet here he is crucified, dead. What a crisis. And so because of that, death brings you and me sorrow, does it not? So Yes, they're weeping and they're lamenting, but the world is rejoicing. What do we say about the world? We've explained a couple weeks ago that the world here is talking about the world system. The evil world system that Satan is controlling is rejoicing. And in that sense, it was the Pharisees and the religious leaders, the Sadducees, the Jewish elite, they thought that they had killed Jesus. Maybe some of the Romans, the Roman soldiers, oh, We crucified this guy. We beat him. We're going to bury him. And we know that many people who are against the Lord, they're rejoicing. But you, disciples, will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn to joy. Not only are they sad because Jesus is crucified, but they will be sad, as I mentioned, because of their shame. In their hearts, they're like, we we betrayed Christ, especially Peter. I denied him three times like he predicted And they're all scattered and hiding except for John. And they're afraid and they're waiting. And so those three days in the grave, they're lamenting in sorrow. Jesus' other followers, the woman, Jesus' mom, Mary, even though they had heard Jesus' teaching, remember, why do we need to sympathize with them? I don't think any of us sitting in this room would be like, well, if I were there, I would have trusted in Christ. You know what? The gospel wasn't complete yet. Did you ever think of that? What is it that frees you and me from sorrow and depression? It is the gospel of Jesus Christ. What is the good news, beloved, that Jesus died for our sins and he rose again from the dead? At this point, the resurrection did not historically happen yet. So they don't have cause for true joy that you and I have. But soon, Sunday morning would come, would it not? Soon, their sorrow would turn to joy. Soon. And that's what he's saying, in a little while, three days, three days. And so that's why I believe that there's a double meaning to the second little while. A little while and you'll see me again. There's a narrow sense and a wider sense. And if you want to read more about this, you can get the commentary from D.A. Carson. There is a narrow sense where Jesus is literally saying, it's really just a little while, three days. And you will see me again, and you will rejoice when you see me in my post-resurrection appearance. So that's the narrow sense of the interpretation. A little while, you will not see me. I'm going to be crucified. And then in a little while, you will see me again. But then how do you and I see Jesus? Right? Because Jesus has been saying throughout this passage, and this is where to MacArthur's point, This is where he's drawing his interpretation, and I see this as the wider sense, is that the disciples, they will see Jesus temporarily after his resurrection, and then after 40 days, he's going to ascend into heaven, and they will still see him 
they will experience his presence through what? Through the Holy Spirit, which is the big idea of John 14 through 16. Remain in me. How will you dwell with me? Don't worry. I will come into your hearts. I will dwell with you through the Holy Spirit, right? So you look at verse 17 of John 14. I have it on the slide for you. For those of you who are new to our slides, CF simply means cross-reference, okay? So this is a cross-reference. Uh, verse 17, it says, The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. So in a little while, you will not see me. Then in a little while, you will see me again and you will rejoice. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while. See the usage? You see the usage? A little while, same phrase in the Greek, right? A little while, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live. So there's the resurrection. You also will live. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. So you cannot separate the resurrection of Christ from the indwelling Holy Spirit when it comes to the believer's life. The How you and I experience the resurrection is through the power of the Holy Spirit. It was the Spirit of God that raised Jesus from the grave. It is the Spirit of God that lives in us. So when you and I ask the question, Jesus, how do I experience your resurrection life now on earth? It is through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one that's resurrecting our soul, is he not? And when you talk about joy, a joy that resides in you, a joy that can overcome, a joy that is everlasting, a joy that turns lament and sorrow into dancing and happiness, it's what? It's the spirit within. And so when you look at what John's doing, he's doing a double meaning. He's saying, in a little while, back in our passage, you will see me again. Disciples, literally, you will see me after the resurrection. And for the rest of Jesus' followers, including you and me, we will read about his resurrection, but we will believe in his resurrection. We will see Christ in our hearts. We will see Christ live in our lives. We will see the work of Christ. How? We will see the word of God and believe in Christ, even though we don't literally see him. How? Through the Holy Spirit. That's how Jesus shows up in our lives, through the Holy Spirit. Now, in verses 21, 21 to 24, we see the second movement in the text. So the first movement is, what is Jesus talking about? He's talking about his death and resurrection. He's going to leave his disciples. He's talking about they will see him again and rejoice. When? During his post-resurrection appearance. And then thereafter, even after he goes back into heaven through the Holy Spirit. Okay, easy enough? All right, now, second movement, how does the resurrection turn our sorrow into joy. How does the resurrection turn our sorrow into joy? And this is what we see in verses 21 to 24. And let me show it to you. Verse 21 and 22, it says, when a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. You see her hour? The hour has come for the for the baby to come, so she's going through the birth pains, right? But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So this is something that I've never experienced myself. I can never experience it. My wife has. Many of you women in here have experienced the pain, the pain of child, of laboring, in childbirth, but when you're holding your baby and the baby comes, ideally in most situations, aside from any type of medical crisis, there's immediate joy. There's immediate joy. There's even joy in the laboring because you know that the life that you've been nurturing is soon coming into this world and soon you'll be able to hold that baby boy or baby girl in your arms. And so mothers, you know this all too well. And that's just an illustration that Jesus uses for his disciples to say that the pain that you feel is temporary. It's just temporary. It is a real pain. Now, I love how Jesus is genius. He, he gives you this illustration because he's not saying that you won't have pain in this world. 
He's actually saying no pain, no gain. That we live in a fallen world. We live in a sinful world. There will be disease. There will be stress. There will be lamenting. There will be death. But with Christ, that suffering is only temporary. He's making an illustration that connects with us. That he's not saying to his disciples that you will not suffer any persecution or the life's going to be easy. He's just saying it's going to be temporary and you have to trust me. But the rest of the passage, he's saying, I'm not leaving you. Now you look at verse 22 and in verse 22, he says, so, so also. So just like this illustration, so also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice. And that's why you can't have that joy apart from the Holy Spirit. Right? Stop right there for a second. If it's simply, you're just going to see me again, and he leaves them after his post-resurrection appearance, then they have reason for sorrow because our joy is in being with Jesus. The joy comes with the presence of our Lord. And if the presence of the Lord comes to them after the resurrection, then leaves again, then they have reason to lament. But the reason why they have everlasting joy is not just because of the post-resurrection appearance, but because of the Holy Spirit. And so it is the Spirit of God that, that dwells in us to give us that joy. So verse 22, you also have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice at that appearance, but also through the Holy Spirit, and no one will take your joy from you. Why? Because the Spirit comes to dwell within us. So it's not just the resurrection. The resurrection is the foundation of the joy. The person who makes the resurrection a reality to we who are dying is the Holy Spirit that tells us, even though your physical body is dying, your spirit is alive. Even though during times of depression and sorrow, you feel like your soul is dying, if you're a believer, the Holy Spirit is there to show you no. When you hit rock bottom, you'll hit the rock at the bottom. You've heard that before, and the rock is Christ. And sometimes we have to hit rock bottom. I heard this illustration from a preacher that I listen to often. And so I'll give credit, but I don't want to mention the name of the preacher. And he, he talks about how these diamonds, that you can't really see the brilliance of a diamond. And I'm a guy, so I don't know, you know, four C's. I'm like, what is that, Calvinism, Christ? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you know, well, what is this? You know, cut, cut of the text, clarity of the text, you know, the color of the text, <laughs> the carrot size, but the most important one is the cost. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> what's the cost? But I'm a guy, I don't know, right? So it talks about the brilliance of the diamond. So when you go see a real diamond, what do they do? Sometimes they darken the room, they give you that little thing like this, and they lay the diamond on what? Black velvet cloth, right? Why do they do that? Because if they just show you the diamond like this, you won't see the beauty of it. And so this preacher makes this illustration that sometimes Jesus has to turn off the lights. And you have to experience darkness. Moments of sorrow, moments where you're mentally, in your mind, you're experiencing pain and darkness in your heart. And maybe physically you're going through pain so that you can see the brilliance of the gospel. So you can see the brilliance of God. So that you can recognize the fine details of the Christian life that Jesus has been with you here and here and here and here. That you see the beauty of your suffering and triumphing in Christ. Why? Because the lights have turned out, have been turned down and the darkness and in the darkness, the light of Christ shines the brightest. Would you agree? I thought that was a great illustration. And so sometimes Jesus has to allow for us to go through darkness and he has to allow us to go through suffering. Why? So the brilliance of Christ, our need for Christ, and different for all of us, the joy of our salvation can be the one thing that we're holding on to. Because when we hit rock bottom, we, 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 we hit the rock. And we realize who's holding us and who's been holding us the entire time, our sovereign Lord Jesus Christ saying, I never left you. But you couldn't see it because you were too stressed and you were trying to solve all the problems in the world yourself. But I never left you. I'm that rock at the bottom. Sometimes that's what the Savior does for us. Right? And so then we continue in verses 23 to 24. It says, In that day you will ask nothing of me. Truly I say to you, whatever you ask 
of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you've asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy will be made full. Now, I don't think the text is trying to make the point that it's only in times of darkness that we cry out in prayer. But as the preacher, I'm making that point applicationally. Isn't it interesting that in verse 22, he's talking about sorrow, and I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take that joy from you. And then in verse 23, he goes into prayer. Now, there's some theology that needs to be explained here, is that in that day you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you, that prior to Jesus' death and resurrection, sinful man could not access God the Father. You see the Trinity in full display here. You have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the entire context of John chapter 14, 15, and 16. Then you have, I am the only way to the Father, right? So it's only through Christ. So when we pray to God, we pray to God the Father, but we pray through the Holy Spirit, but we pray in the name of Jesus. It's only because of Jesus Christ that we can go to the Father. We can ask of the Father. We can go directly to the Father. We don't go to the temple. We don't go through the priest. We don't go through animal sacrifice. We go directly in Jesus' name to the heavenly throne room, and we can talk to Yahweh directly. Now, I want to applicationally draw the preacher's point that isn't it when the darkness comes and when the lights shut off and those are the only times that people in our days pray? Isn't it only those times where we really have exhausted Google, that Google can't answer our questions, people can't help us, chat GPT's not giving us the right questions, and so what do we do? Finally, instead of open AI, we go down and we pray. And we say, technology can't help me, medicine can't help me, what do I do but get on my knees and reach for the only joy that I could remember, the joy of Christ. And so it is true that in that day, you will, you will ask nothing, you've asked nothing of me. In that day, you will ask nothing of me, but truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask in the Father, he will give it to you. And in this context, I believe it's the same thing as the rest of John. It's in the context of Jesus' mission. It's in the context of helping Jesus. I'm struggling. Help me remain faithful to you. Help me abide in you. Help me grow in Christ. Help me help others to come to Christ. Ask in that context, and he will give it to you. Verse 24, until now you have asked nothing in my name. Why? Because he hasn't gone to the Father yet. He hasn't died on the cross yet. He hasn't resurrected yet. But after his resurrection, they will begin to ask God the Father directly in the name of Jesus. Why? Because Jesus won't be there. Right now, they can just ask Jesus, Jesus, can you heal? Can you do this for us? But there will be the day where they will have to pray in the Holy Spirit to God the Father, and Jesus won't be there with them but they will ask in his name. Ask and you will receive that your joy will be made full. It's in those moments of darkness. It's in those moments of suffering. It's in those moments of sorrow that we actually ask the Lord and we ask him. We ask him for joy. And the connection I want to make applicationally is it's in those moments, that's when you and I experience the resurrection today. Follow me on this. One day we will die, and we will experience the resurrection in eternity. But I'm not talking about that. I'm asking the question, Jesus rose from the dead. And that's a message, a foundational truth that you and I believe in. How and when do you and I experience resurrection now? Those moments when, you, when you're lamenting, when you're sad, when you're sorrowful, when you find joy in Christ... You're tasting the resurrection because that's exactly the pattern we see in this text. It's the pattern for his disciples, his original disciples. It's the pattern for you and me. Show you this pattern. I know you love stories. I'll tell you a story. In John chapter 11, there's a story of a lovely man named Lazarus who was dead for four days. Same pattern. Okay? His two sisters, Mary and Martha, were filled with sorrow. So there was a temporary time of sorrow and sadness. Their sorrow was legit. Their brother had died. But once Jesus arrived, he raised Lazarus from the dead, resurrection. 
And resurrection changed everything. Jesus turned their joy into sorrow with the resurrection of Lazarus. In Hebrews 11, Hebrews 11, let me tell you another story because you love stories. Hebrews 11, verses 17 and 18. It says this, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, who he had received the promises, was an act of offering up his only son. So we know the story of Abraham. Abraham and Sarah could not bear biological children. God promised that through you, blessing would come to the nations. In other words, through you, the Messiah will come. Through you, the promise seed will come. How can it come if we can't have kids? I'm going to send you a miracle child. He sends the miracle child. It's the only son. It's God's son, literally, because it's a miracle child, right? And so they have Isaac. The hope of the world and the hope of the promise to Abraham and his legacy is on this only son. And God asks Abraham, I want you to kill your son as a sacrifice. I'm testing you. Well, no, Abraham doesn't know that God's testing him. Abraham doesn't know that God's testing him. But Abraham has faith. What does, God, what does Abraham place his faith in? Well, he places his faith in the person of God. But what does Abraham, way back before Jesus' time, what does Abraham place his faith in, beloved? Read the next verse, verse 18, right? Hebrews 11, verse 18. I don't have it on the slide for you. Of whom it was said through Isaac shall your offspring be, be named... But it says in Hebrews 11 that Abraham believed that God could raise his son from the dead. My goodness, long before the gospel, Abraham had faith. And what was his faith? His faith was in the ability of God to resurrect his son from the dead. But then God, you know the story, God says, no, 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 stop, stop, stop. Don't kill your son. This was just a test. There's a ram in the thicket, a sacrificial ram. Sacrifice the ram instead. Your son will live. But Abraham was willing to go through and kill his son. Why? Because he believed in the resurrection long before Jesus. And so when people say, was Abraham a Christian? He was a Christian. He believed that God could raise his son. Isaac was a gift Isaac was a prototypical son of God. Not biologically, a biological process, but a miracle. Abraham believed that God could raise his only son long before Jesus. He didn't know who Jesus was. Abraham practice prototypical Christian faith, and the foundation of the Christian faith is a belief in the resurrection of God's Son. Hebrews 11 preaches the gospel. I have this joke with Gabe. You know, Gabe's preaching through Leviticus for IT, and he's like, how should I preach this? I'm like, just preach Hebrews. I'm just kidding. (laughs) Some of you get that joke. When we experience resurrection, that's when we have our joy. In the moment when you're struggling with sadness, depression, or sorrow, and it's pressing down on you, you have to exercise faith. When you reach inside and and you say, Jesus, I'm feeling sad, but I'm going to find joy in you. Even though my circumstance is not changing, I'm pulling for you. My, My body's physically in pain, and my circumstance is not changing. This cancer is coming, or whatever it might be, but I'm pulling for you. What you're practicing right there is the pattern of the resurrection, because one day you're going to experience the physical reality of that. But that's what's happening in the hospital bed. That's what's happening when you're in the doctor's office and, and you get that uh, diagnosis of cancer. That's what's happening when you're, when you're fighting with your spouse and, and you know you're Christian, so divorce is out of the question and you're wondering where you go next and you know that eventually you have to reconcile, but you're in that pain trying to die to yourself and you're reaching for power. What are you doing? You're saying, I need to trust in Christ. That's resurrection. You're you're practicing the pattern of resurrection. When when you're overwhelmed by your email and your assignments and your workload and and you're trying to raise your kids too and you're stressed and you break down and you say, Lord, I just need you because you're my only hope, that's resurrection. 
You see, when everything on this world just shows you death, when Abraham was there and he says, there's no other solution but to believe that God could actually raise my son from the dead, that's faith. That's resurrection. You know, John 15, in context, verse 11, says, These things I've spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, that your joy will be made full. How is the joy made full? Through the Holy Spirit reminding us of the resurrection that lives in you and me. Romans 15, 13. Oh, I love the book of Romans. Romans 15, 13. It says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. So the Holy Spirit gives you the hope. What's the hope? What's the foundation of our hope? The resurrection. And of course, we know this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 where Paul says that apart from the resurrection, we have no hope, that the foundation of the Christian faith is the resurrection, is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So beloved, when you and I face stress, sorrow, sadness of varying degrees, when we reach for joy and exercise our faith in Christ, even though our circumstances don't change, that's when you are experiencing the power of the resurrection. And trust Christ. He will walk with you. Now, the big idea this morning is Christ turns our joy, our sorrow into joy through his resurrection and the Holy Spirit. Christ turns our sorrow into joy through his resurrection and the Holy Spirit. Three final application points, quick ones. Just like Jesus' 11 disciples, we must trust in the promises of Christ. We must trust in the biblical teachings of Christ. We don't have Jesus right in front of us. But the Holy Spirit has inspired 66 books of the Bible, and the Holy Spirit lives in you as a believer. And when you read the Bible as a born-again believer, the Holy Spirit does his work. He uses the words that he's inspired to say, hey, when you can't trust in this world, and when all your solutions aren't solving your problems, trust in the Word of God. And you know what makes the Word of God come alive in your heart, where it's not just knowledge or stories or religious literature, but it becomes faith? It's the Holy Spirit. So the Bible becomes the promises of Christ. So whereas Jesus was speaking to his disciples, Jesus has left us with his teachings in the Bible. And we need to trust in the promises of Christ as laid out in the 66 books of the Bible. And we exercise our faith there and the Holy Spirit helps us. Secondly, just like Jesus' 11 disciples, we too receive the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit of God will comfort us through all trials. And lastly, we have access to God, the Father, in Jesus' name. And so the last application is we have to pray. Prayer shouldn't be our last resort where we've exhausted everything, we've tried to take the wheel, and finally we do the Carrie Underwood. Okay, Jesus, you take the wheel. It's too late. You're about to run into the ocean. Seriously? It's after the wreck is coming, then you say, Jesus, take the wheel. It's too late. We have to condition our hearts that as soon as before we start driving we say okay you take the will but i'm going to trust you i'm gonna i'm gonna do human responsibility but you're sovereign right it's an intersection of god's sovereignty and our human responsibility yes we have to navigate and solve problems but it's too late if we try everything then we pray we need to pray at the same we need to pray first let jesus take the will and then you guide Right? And the, but the Holy Spirit's really guiding you. If you don't have Christ, please receive Christ this morning. Christ is our hope. Without the resurrection of Christ, you don't have hope in life. If you want to receive Christ, I want everyone to bow your heads now. Everyone, heads bows, bowed, eyes closed. If you want to receive Christ, I want you simply to pray this prayer. And then afterwards, come see me at the next steps table. And we would love to lead you in terms of committing yourself to Jesus Christ. Pray this prayer. Father, I have experienced sadness in life. I have experienced sorrow in life. But I know, Lord, that you are the hope. Father, this morning I confess that I've sinned against a holy God. I confess that I'm a sinner in need of your grace and your mercy. 
But I believe that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for my sins. And I believe that you raised your son from the dead. Father, I want to change, but I need your help. I pray that you will change my heart, cause me to repent, turn my sadness and my sorrow into rejoicing and joy because of the resurrection of Christ. If that's a prayer that you prayed, I want to see you at the next steps table. No judgment. I'd love to lead you. And our pastors and our next steps table members would love to lead you to receive Christ. For the rest of us, let's pray together. Father, we will experience sadness in life. We will experience sorrow in life. But in those moments of sadness, sorrow, stress, pressure, physical illness, all the hardships of life, Lord, I pray, Lord, that you will help our hearts to practice the pattern of the resurrection, not the pattern of the world, not the pattern of death, but the pattern of life. Pray, Lord, that in those moments that you would remind us first to pray to you, to let you take the will, and then secondly, to place our faith in you, that everything's going to be okay because of you, and to trust you, regardless of circumstance. In that moment, help us all as believers to experience the power of your resurrection through the person of the Holy Spirit. Help us to do that. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.